string along the beach and how they would attach it and how six weeks later you had this big bunch. And then they would dry it and there was one company in the United States called FMC that bought everything. That project generated 17,000 jobs. The project originally was a strategy to avoid dynamite fishing. Because dynamite fishing is a strategy of survival. No one wants to destroy with dynamite, illegally trade dynamite and destroy corals with dynamite in order to get the fish. I mean, you need to be pretty desperate to do that. And so what we realized is that there was this strategy of this professor who got his PhD in Hawaii, who did his postdoc in the Philippines, who said, I'm going to become the seaweed farmer. Then climate change happens, temperature rises, and now the women who could walk into the sea up to their knees now have to walk into the sea up to their chests. Why? Because they need one degree lower temperature. Now, I just want to put a sense into, the, into your minds that a one degree difference means for these women that they have to wade into the water up to their chest for eight hours a day while they were doing it up to their knees. And it's not because the sea level is rising, the sea is already getting hotter, and that one, temperature, one degree difference cuts down their productivity of seaweed. So I've been living in that atmosphere for quite a while. We have lost about 50% of the production um, in Tanzania. We still have. The employment dramatically dropped as well. And that is why the encounter with Doug and with Joost was so important. We realized that we have been putting so much of our attention on the land and we kind of forgotten there's something that is the sea. 70%, 70% of the earth is covered by the sea. But if we look at the space, the three-dimensional space available, 99% of the space available to farm, to produce food, to produce energy, is the sea and only 1% is the land. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not doing 3D farming at an altitude of 20, 30, 50 meters high. Although a rainforest is able to produce 500 tons of biomass per year, when I listen to Duck and Joost, but particularly Duck, who has been pushing these uh, productive systems forward, you're getting 1,000 tons? Yes. A thousand tons. Now, I just want you to put it in your minds and go away from here. If you have the best genetically modified corn, with the best chemistry, with the best precision farming, with the best satellite connections, with the best scientists behind it, you never pass the 20 tons a hectare. I mean, uh, let's wake up. 20 tons for the smartest farming that we have today, for corn, for soy and the like. If you have sugar cane, you may push it up to 110 tons, 120 tons, but you're not getting to the 1,000 tons. So when we look at the efficiency to produce food, to produce fertilizer, to produce energy, we really have to start exploring the sea. And that's why I would first like to give a few words to Doug and, and, and tell us your discovery of what you can... When you get to a thousand tons, what, what all can you do with that? Thank you, Gunther. However, I, I would like, with your permission, to, to paint a, a mental picture before I get into to how I arrive at a thousand tons, because it is important, I think, that we're all on the same uh, uh, mental framework of the reason <coughs> why we, we require this thousand tons. And uh, in Following up on your idea, I'd like to tell a story, not just any story, but by the way, it's my own story, but I'd like it in two parts, and uh, I will keep it short because I un understand the time frame. So part one of the story will be before 1967, part two of the story will be after 1967. Uh, 
uh, it, it will become e evident why 1967 is uh, so important. So the, the bit before 1967 is important because without what happened before 1967, for me, the things wouldn't have happened that happened after 1967. So I will s start at the first part of the story. And the first thing that happened was, of course, I, I was born at an early age. Um, you were born at age zero. Well, that's, that's quite <laughs> early. Uh, so just just want to be certain. No <laughs> reincarnation there. I, I was born at an er early age, before 1967. I went to school, and I went to university. That's the end of part one. So that's how short I'm keeping things. We, I must get points for, for, for that. Part two starts with uh, January 1967. I happen to get a job with a, a reasonably unknown or organization at that time called NASA. And I start to work for them in, in January 1967. And when, when you hear the uh, uh, phases of, of a business plan and um, you, you hear that it is it is ridiculous and then dangerous, and then it goes in, into the third phase. No, the NASA plan was ridiculous and dangerous, all tied up in one thing and didn't change from, from that. The plan, of course, was to, was to land a man on, on the moon. In fact, that would have been easy if that was, was the plan. Unfortunately, they overcomplicated it they also wanted the man to come back from, from the moon. And that was, was the difficult part. Landing him there was, was easy. That, that was, wasn't diff difficult at, at all. You point a rocket the right way, put him in inside, you shoot it off, the guy lands. Easy. Get him home is not, not so easy. So that was the difficult part. However, there were a number of events in, 19, in 1967 that really... Uh, affected the way I went forward in life and working for NASA wasn't one of those it was indirectly but it wasn't one one of those, those events so mid 1967 I had my birthday as most pe people have each each year I turned 19 by, by the way and then what happened I met a girl you might say that's that's not strange it ha happened for me it was because if you look at part one, I was born, I went to school, I went to university. There's no mention of girls in, in that, that framework. So this was actually a very, very special event for me because I met a girl. What does a 19-year-old boy do when, when he meets a girl for the first time? Of course, you uh, propose marriage. That's, that's the first thing to do. Which I think I we have evolved in the meantime. <laughs> which, which I did. For my good luck, she accepted. And that created a huge stability in my life then. I'm happy to say I still have the girl and I still have the stability. So and she's sitting in the front row. And, and she's sitting Woo. in the front row. Front row. So The second thing that happened was I met a boy. But don't take that the wrong, wrong way. <laughs> uh, he, he wasn't a boy. He was a, a man. He was 14 years older than, than me. He, uh, he was a space a scientist, an ast astrophysicist who I was, was mixing with. He was a photographer. He had a keen passion in photography, which which then led to his importance in my, my life. His name was Carl Sagan. Some of you may, may have heard of him. And the event that then changed my life, I had stability, but now I had change coming, happened in 1990. A little bit longer, a little, little bit of time away. On the 14th of February, 1990, by coincidence, it, it, it was Valentine's Day, but 
Carl Sagan took a photograph of Earth. And that photograph had a huge impact on my life. By the way, a lot of you in, in this room today were in that photograph. Anyone who was born before the 14th of February 1990 was in that photograph. The, the photograph, very similar to yesterday's photo with, with a drone, was taken with, with a little bit, bit of a bigger drone. It, it was the Voyager 1 spacecraft. It was 5 billion kilometers away from Earth. And it took this photo of Earth. Well, it wasn't of Earth. It took a photo of, of the universe. But against this background of the universe, Earth was in this photograph. But I need to put it into perspective how it looked in, in this photograph. And in this background of space, of course, billions upon billions of stars, and think of a ray of sunlight, and I'm fortunate I've got one here. So the photo is our background here. This is a ray of sunlight, and in that ray of sunlight, I, I guess many of you have seen a suspended speck of dust in a sunlight beam. It's quite common. That was Earth. So this is the Milky Way, 500 billion stars. This is the u universe. Imagine how many billions and billions of stars. This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. In it, there, there's a speck of dust. That's us. Now, it is not only us. It is the home of everybody you have ever heard of. It is the home of every human being who has ever been on this planet. It is the home of everything we have. It's been the home of all the wars, all the, the ha happinesses, the sadnesses, everything. And you see this very, very fragile speck of us that is our home. It is our only home. And it's in this vast universe. It is minute. It is fragile. The fragility is what we need to take care of. We need, first of all, to show respect for every other human being on this speck of dust. And more importantly, we need to take care of the environmental conditions on that speck of dust. Now, in today's world where we have evolved to, there are four things that are key to us having on this speck of dust, this pale blue dot. Food, water, energy, and our greenhouse gas emissions. There is only one product that fulfills the requirements of all four of those things, and it happens to be seaweed. Seaweed will give us food, it will give us water, it will give us energy, and it absorbs a vast amount of carbon, helping us with our greenhouse gas emissions. Think of the, the impact that that has on us. And by the way, you've just heard, 70% of the Earth's uh, resources are the sea, and we don't use them to, for any uh, huge benefit for us. In fact, we use it as, as a dump ground. We, we've heard of so ma many things where, where we simply th throw things in it. Our poor fishy even can't survive it in it, which is part of our food source, and we're killing them. And yet, we do nothing concrete about that. You hear about energy solutions, and they're wo wonderful ones. I think, think this kite is absolutely fantastic, and it, it has a, a cost of it. Energy, I've heard today, five cents per kilowatt hour, fantastic. Seaweed cannot give, give you that. The levelized 
cost of en energy of seaweed is around 16 cents a kilowatt hour. However, if you take that seaweed and in, in the typical blue economy model, you first get food from it. You then get water from it. You then get energy from it. You then use it for the other things, and there are many other things you, you can do with, with it, ranging from e extraction of cosmetics, uh, fertilizers. I mean, I, I can go on for, for a long time, and I, I, I don't have much time. And we then help with our uh, gr greenhouse gas emissions. What is the true levelized cost of energy from our seaweed? And I would venture to say it is not 16 cents, it is not 5 cents, it is not 0 cents. In fact, it is minus 5 cents or minus 10 cents or minus 16 cents. So if you take all of the, the resources and revenue streams from seaweed, we can give you energy that is actually, it isn't costing you any, anything because of what seaweed is giving us in all, all the other things. So that's why I am here to, to talk about seaweed, and I've taken a bit longer than, than I should have, but I think I've painted the picture. But uh, what is very important, uh, Doug, is seaweed can be considered a pioneer species. That means when you start regenerating seaweed, life could come back around the seaweed? Well, it, it, we have shown that Seaweed, first of all, it, it, it absorbs carbon dioxide, but it also absorbs all the other harmful things in the sea. It, it filters the sea. It brings back fish life. It regenerates coral. All the mussels and mollusks and uh, shellfish love it. They come back in, into the, the environment. It has a huge benefit, and th those are some of the be benefits I said I, we, we didn't have time to, to expand on, on them all. But yes, it gives all, all of that. So, Doug, if I translate that in our popular language, it means that we can regenerate forests on the land, and now we can start regenerate the forests of the sea. Well, Im importantly, one of the byproducts of, of energy from, from seaweed is a remarkably efficient fertilizer. Why don't we use that fertilizer to re reinvent our forests on, on the land, so we use the, the sea to help the land rather than our land-based animals destroying the sea. And Joost, you are turning that now into some business developments? Yeah, I think that's just to build on uh, what Doug is saying about what seaweed all can do. It's interesting to see how to, to implement that. And um, what, what, what the beauty of seaweed is, is that Theoretically, it grows everywhere in the world where you have CO2, salt water, sunshine, and nutrients. Well, there are quite some places in the, w in the world where, where you can Now, grow nutrients, can you just say what nutrients? Could it be the effluent from a city? Can it be the nutrients coming from the currents from the Antarctic? Uh, what are the among nutrients? Among others are the nutrients that flow off land, the nutrients that are in... Uh, and very interesting, actually, is the nutrients that come from fishery, fish farms. So if you talk about synergies, that the, the stuff that, uh, that the fish are shitting out is, is actually the food for, for, for seaweed. So seaweed is a, is a very, um, let's say, a forgiving species. And apart from that, it's the fastest growing biomass on this planet. So given the fact beating that Beating mushrooms, we'll ask... Uh, I don't have the facts about that, but okay. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it... But if anyway, if it's it nice to know there's more than one that's doing good. Exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> but the good thing is we can, we can grow seaweed and a lot of seaweed and therefore have a lot of biomass available for all the different applications that there are. Now imagine thinking about blue economy models if you would do this on different space in the world, like the coast of Argentina or Chile or the Seychelles and... You start with a seaweed farm and then local community can use it for food purposes or to create energy, use the effluent to, to fertilize their grounds, set up new industries because seaweed you can use it to make textile, to use it as a feed, animal supplement. So all kind of new uh, industries can start up. So it's almost a self-feeding ecosystem that, that will start with 
we had a seaweed farm, actually. No, no, run me through some of the numbers. If, if I want to have one hectare of seaweed, and with the wisdom and the experience of Doug, we get a ton of seaweed on there. I mean, 100 tons, 1,000 tons. No, let me correct that. We harvest one ton per annum from that hectare. Annually. You, you get one ton annually from every hectare of sea space. Okay. It, it, it's not that, that we have one ton in there in one time because we have multiple harvests per annum. And unlike land-based products, seaweed grows all, all year and some of them have a very short cycle and we harvest it every three weeks. Fine. But once you, ha w w run me through some of the numbers that you have. What does it cost to invest in this? What, what kind of returns do you see? I mean, uh, how much gas do you make? I mean, you both can respond. I mean, if you have this seaweed, how much gas do you get out of it? Does it compete with shale gas? Well, we, we this question, <laughs> we went together to, to Argentina for a very nice uh, project, Gunther and I. To, to see if we could use seaweed as an, as an alternative uh, for, for shale gas using actually dog's invention, and I'm glad that I can, can share that here. Um, uh, Doc has invented a way how you can transform seaweed into biogas. Well, this is not the place now to do this. I think it's very important because that means that out of uh, every ton uh, of seaweed, we can produce 200 cubic meters of gas. Well, that number is probably not, not related to anything, um, but that's a lot of gas. And more importantly, that seaweed contains, or the gas contains a lot of methane, and that's the stuff that you want. That's the stuff that says boom if you put a lighter next to it. Um, so that is an extremely interesting application of it. Now, if you look at food, for instance, uh, because probably that's the topic now, um, we are running now a, uh, a project in Ireland, and what we see there, if we just use the seaweed as food, as the wakame salad. Now, so we had it yesterday at lunch. There was this little green wakame salad. Maybe you know it, the Japanese. You all know wakame? Well, the price of wakame are quite interesting. Right now in the supermarket, it sells for about 30 euros per kilogram. Um, and I'll tell you, it doesn't cost 30 euros to produce it. <laughs> Uh, it's it's uh, if you can create if you can generate the right amount the efficient amount of, of of seaweed out of every hectare you can create a very economic interesting economic model. So the previous forum would have been very nice to see there are different uh, business models possible with seaweed. Um, now that's only the food. If you there are extracts in seaweed that ha attracts the interest of the farmers uh, pharmacy industry. There are some fucoxanthin and fucoids. Um, there's not a lot of it in each uh, per, per, per kilogram, but it sells for about 10,000 euros per kilogram. Uh, of course, there's always a trade-off in how easy it is to get out of it, and, 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 and uh, etc. But right now, we're getting there. So the numbers uh, are, are very interesting and very supporting. And the, the big challenge right now is like, how can we make it available at such a scale that we can all benefit from the, the, the CO2 reducing, or let's say in worst case, CO2 neutral, but in many cases, CO2 reducing applications. So, so help the audience through the logic. To invest in a hectare of space for farming, what's the cost? Give us an order of magnitude to get a sense. Is, are we talking about thousands, ten thousands, millions? Uh, no, let me. If we g if we go to um, uh, <laughs> a good question, uh, I, I made the calculations in relationship to let's say the energy situation. So we did some calculations then with with Doug for Indonesia, and we came to if we go large scale, you come to a uh, figure of about two and a half million per square kilometer. Square kilometer. That's twenty five thousand per hectare. Twenty five thousand per hectare. And then you have the, the uh, but you talk large scale. It's not if I want to start tomorrow, but we talk about. But scale. why do we think is one square kilometer large? I mean, how many millions of hectares are dedicated to corn farming? I'm just, just, just it's ask. Not, well, we, we did a calculation in Argentina. Now we, we found out in Patagonia right now, the traditional oil companies are, are, are looking for shale gas. And 
if I'm correct, it's about an area between 12,000 and 30,000 square kilometers of Patagonia. They are waiting for shale gas. Now, we have calculated that we would need 3,500 to 4,000 square kilometers of sea to generate the same amount of gas with the digester. That if I may yeah. to just come back to your, your question where, where you asked, can seaweed energy compete with shale gas? I would like to suggest you, you alter your mindset and ask that a different way. C can shale gas compete with seaweed energy? Yeah. Yeah. And, and your conclusion is? <laughs> <laughs> the numbers speak for, for yeah. themselves. I, I don't Can we get some numbers? I mean, would you be interested in some numbers like this? I mean, I think we, 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 we're in need of some of these numbers. Uh, um, you know, not in an Excel spreadsheet, please. No, no not Excel. Uh, the, the numbers, if, if I may interrupt you just a little, the uh, numbers should not be represented in, in an Excel spreadsheet. There is uh, a human sustainability, there's, there's environmental Im impacts which are never calculated in, into Excel spreadsheets. And when you look at a seaweed farm, you shouldn't just say, what is the cost of the farm to generate so much e energy? You should say, for this amount of money, we are going to produce e energy and an amount, produce food, produce fertilizer, produce fresh water, by the way, because seaweed, you, you may, may not realize it, is a desalinator. Even though it lives in s salt water, the actual water that comes out of the seaweed, which is 95% <coughs> of the weight of the seaweed, is fresh water. It is desalinated. Imagine did, if you did, did you know, Town, know yeah? that seaweeds are desalinators? I mean, and so when you're processing it, one of your byproducts. Now, I, I need to ask you, where is your test unit, your, m your reference point? In, in the lovely ladies' country, in Cape Town, and we do all of our re research and development in Cape Town for a number of reasons. First of all, the South African people, as you have witnessed, are, are fantastic ambassadors for, for their country. Secondly, and th this was more serious business decision, when you are building and developing something, you need to build it and develop it in an environment that is the harshest you can find so that when you put it anywhere else in the world, you don't have any bad surprises. The west coast of Africa is remarkably harsh. For those of you who, who know the sea, there are... 27 meter high waves on the west of the, the African coast. We decided if we did our tests in those environments, our development in those environments, there is nothing that anybody could throw at us after that that we would be afraid of. So we did our development, we still do all of our re research in Cape Town, and we have got our growing platforms in areas that have experienced 27 meter waves while our platforms are there and they have survived absolutely perfectly with no no destruction so Joost, how do you think about going further with this uh, what is your well i think the, uh, the 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 discussion was the same as this morning the the the, the prototypes the proof of concept is is done is ready uh, we are in dire need of projects, finance projects. I think that's a, g a good way to, to, to expand this. Um, the, to be honest, the world uh, still needs a little bit of convention, it seems like. It's not that everyone is on our doorstep and say like, wow, can we, can, how can we fund this? Uh, but sharing the story helps and it opens up the possibility. It's, it's almost a matter of uh, uh, shifting paradigms then convincing them about about uh, a great opportunity, about a great uh, economic revolution. Um, now, so have you done some planetary analysis or national? What does it mean for uh, uh, for the world if we were to shift to seaweed instead of uh, embracing shale gas? You know, mm -hmm. macroeconomically, what would it be if we are e we're integrating 
10% uh, of the seaweed and seaweed extracts in our food basket. Um, have you looked at well some of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, uh, two, two interesting numbers. One of the applications of seaweed, for instance, is if you use it as a, um, as a supplement for animal feed. If you just add 5% of dried seaweed, a mix of dried seaweed to animal feed, then a couple of things happen. And one of our partners, he had a company to, to deliver a feed supplement in the US. Now, interestingly, the pigs that were feed, uh, getting feed seaweed, they could get completely off antibiotics. The cows got a shiny skin, were giving one and a half liter more milk per day, and got less infections. And horses got very tranquil when they were put on transport. It was so impressive that the farmers said, if this works for the animals, it works for me. So they started eating the supplement. <laughs> Now, our partner is providing that just as a separate product because he said you can buy it as well. Um, if animals, uh, cows, eat this amount of seaweed, they reduce, and that's very important if you talk about CO2, they're methane, they, they're burping methane. It's not that they're shitting methane, they're burping methane. But that methane that reduces by 60 to 90% even if you add seaweed to their... Now, that is an impact on the world. There and... By the way, methane is 50 times more harmful than CO2. to our greenhouse gas effect than So let's come CO2 to, to you, Ivanka. I mean, I have had the privilege of knowing and working with you for, yeah, a couple decades. Um, uh, <laughs> we know. <laughs> but um, you came out of a crisis situation in the Balkan Wars. Yes. And you had a food crisis as well. I mean, tell us just a little bit about where you come from, like Doug did, and, and I think take it from there to where you are now. Okay, thank you very much for um, offering me a chance to talk about that. Uh, it's a really privilege for me. I am uh, I'm coming from the middle of Balkan, because uh, if I s uh, say, if I... Uh, announce the name of my country, I, it will make confusion because in that time it was Yugoslavia and today it is Serbia and what will be tomorrow, it's, a, it's a very difficult to estimate. But anyway, I am biologist and uh, after my fi finishing study I got an, uh, a job in some very big, uh, you know, traditional communist uh, institute for agriculture research and they gave them to me a task because I was biologist, not agronomist, to do a deal with the mushroom. And nobody didn't have a clue about the mushrooms. So I had a very lucky occasion to fi finish my PhD and put to, fin to continue my study in Holland, in Horst. So, so there I spent uh, several years. And unlike 95% uh, of my friends in that time, I decided to come back in Serbia just because I think that the, the matter of the happiness and emotion uh, is uh, much more important than just uh, occasion and situation. And I never regret, beside all mess what we had and what we still have. And then I drop on in the very, very, very big uh, factory after my returning. And uh, I would like to emphasize, I still have fantastic relation with all those scientists from Holland in that time. We are a very small branch, so everybody knows everyone. So I drop on, on the middle of well-known Kosovo, today you know or don't know, doesn't matter, but it is, it is X or still part of Serbia, I don't care. And there I managed the most biggest factory for oyster mushroom uh, production in that time. Final product should go in that time in SAS, Swedish Airlines. Uh, in the meantime, SAS do I think that it does not exist any longer, but in that time, oh, final, uh, final product should go in the catering, but because of the political blockade, because of the wars, because of the everything, it was stopped, but I fa faced with the problem with the spent substrate. And uh, thanks to that spent substrate after uh, oyster mushroom production and utilization of the um, uh, <coughs> that material in possible animal feed, like possible animal feed, because we had been short in everything, including in animal feed. And thanks so, to so um, Ivanka, let yeah? me just... Uh, so you were taking what 
to grow the mushrooms on? Uh, we, t we are still taking, in that time and today, we are taking the cellulose-based material. What you well, can well, find translate in that, that in the straw. Straw, straw. okay. We okay. all know straw. <laughs> straw. Okay, so she was using straw. Yes, we produce uh, oyster in that so time. So the mushrooms pop out yeah. of the straw, and then? And then spam substrate. The waste after the, after the not waste waste does not exist. I learned the that leftover. From you. <laughs> the leftover, the side product of the mushroom cultivation, which is the spent substrate, we had used, and still we are using like a component for the ruminant feeding. Okay, so are we all following? That means straw, which no animal eats, is converted into food for human beings and nutrition for animals. Yeah. And is it good <coughs> enough <coughs> as a nutrition? Okay. okay, my colleague and my team always said, not grow mushroom in order to have component for animal feeding. But if you already growing the mushroom, then please use that spent compost so in the technology. So l let's just get the big picture again, which I was looking for in our global change. I mean, this is the Zermatt Summit. We look at the summit. We want to have the big picture. <laughs> it means that how much can you change from the present feed of the animal, the ruminants, to this? 10%? 20%? 10%. 10%. That means we can reduce the amount of feed that is today farmed in terms of soy, in terms of corn and all of that, we can take 10% and actually give them straw to eat. Straw. What's the cost price of straw? Uh, I would like to tell you the cost price of straw is not uh, very, very low. But when you use that straw, like already some material for something where you already provide some profit, so, in fact, this material, what you have left over, is definitely for free. So, so what we now have to do is to get your spent straw and blend it with some seaweed? Yep. Yeah. Some extra additional are we Are we getting into the feed business by now? Uh, I mean, do we see how we can transform the actual food chain in our system? Yes, please. Yeah. And later on, we start uh, on the beginning of 2000, uh, after all mess, and uh, uh, and I really would like to emphasize, I told to Miss Elizabeth last evening, after her lovely concert of Via, during the 90s, thanks of my mushrooms, we feeded the hospitals for mental diseases people, because they just didn't have enough food. So in the cellar of, the, of all those hospitals, I grow the mushroom in the prisons, and uh, you know, it was, uh, how I can tell you, it, it, is n it was not a nice time, definitely not a nice time, but experience uh, what uh, all my team and myself collected during that time today is implement, is our uh, very specific uh, small company, name Ecofungi, I will kindly ask if it is possible uh, if we... <laughs> we have, have a short video. You know, we have a very just illustration of all what we are going around. Okay, uh, let's, yeah? let's have a look at that. Yeah, it's a very short indeed. I
Now, I want, I would like you to just remember that she's saying she does it in the basement of the hospitals and the prisons as well. Now, may I submit to you that if you can do it in the basement of the prison and the hospital, you can do it um. everywhere. And I think this is an empowering statement. That is, we, every city can become a producer of its own mushrooms. Every city can start doing that. And, but now, fast forward, Ivanka, how many mushrooms do you produce now yourself every day? About 600 uh, kg of organic. Uh, all our production is certified organically according to the European standard. It is about 600 kg. And, uh, and more important, how many people have already come to be trained in your <laughs> facilities to know what you do? I, uh, directly, it is about uh, 70, maybe about seven zero. But indirectly, there is a, like, I don't know that you don't like that, wor that word, but like, let's say, call for franchising, you know. But let's say cy cycles around my students. So my students already have the students, and their students already have the students. And I think that Tobias, where is the Tobias? I think Tobias is Tobias just, Tobias there he is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> excuse me. And uh, he, can, uh, he absolutely can confirm that uh, this, our model of doing business, really can meet uh, several emphasizing facts what our friends and colleagues and great authorities meet. First, we are doing everything based on innovation, but not innovation which is scary. This is just useful and nice innovation. Then, we have a very nice, and it is the matter of the personality, nice uh, relation inside of this team, and this is also something we try to transfer also to the students who are coming at our place. And finally, Maybe we can make a deal. I am so small and modest for all your in, uh, actions around the globe uh, in, the, in your boat. But maybe our dehydrated food, organic, is fantastic for the, for the sailors, for the boats, because it doesn't use the room and you always have a fresh product uh, which remains at the soul. Just going in line with the, uh, with the spirit of the conference. <laughs> Ivanka was voted Entrepreneur of the Year in Serbia. <laughs> and her generosity of being prepared to teach anyone who wants to come and spend, what do you need to spend, one week at your place? One week, yes, tomorrow, just course, and uh, today uh, uh, the group of night, night persons really from all around the globe just landed and... Uh, I hope that. Uh, do you know they, they will apply it? They apply it as well? Or uh, is it uh, yes. Uh, you, me, and Tobias, and people from our cycling inter know 95% percent, uh, percent of them even try. And a lot of them, Parotism, is one of our successful stories. Beyond Cafe, indirectly, of course. Uh, in Barcelona, we had the project. In Australia, I hope in Argentina will be for a short period of time. And, and it looks like you're going to have people yeah, from Mauritius. Yes, and, 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 yeah. and what about Zermatt? Yeah. Do the people eat mushrooms in Zermatt? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, their footprint is quite important. Uh, but what I would like to really share with this uh, short panel, you know, um, our first uh, session was very much about the energies and, and the internet and so on, and that modernity that we're having in our favors. But here we're talking about something basic, that is food. I mean, we're just talking about food and feed for animals. And the leverage of impact that we have is just extraordinary. And, and we need, and that's why this panel is slightly, you know, we need to have the wisdom we need to have the entrepreneur, and, and I would say Joost is the business strategist, right? You name it. You <laughs> name it? Because you didn't tell your story because you come from one of the typical consultancy groups. Yeah. Is it true. worth mentioning, or would you like to keep it as a secret? No, it's not a secret. Okay. So <laughs> no, I can, I, can, I can briefly share. So This is important, you tell you, and with that we'll yeah. close up and have some questions. So the, okay? the, reas the reason I, I, I'm here at this point is that um, after university I started working for the traditional multinationals, Procter & Gamble, and I spent two years in the board of Pepsi-Cola. And then my, big my first son was born, and I was making marketing plans to get kids more drinking cola. And I didn't know anything about personal values then, but it felt not right here. 
So I decided to quit my job together with my wife. I started a consulting firm and we were we thought we can transform management teams. If we, tr if we transform the management team, the organization has been transformed. I did it for 15 years, got a little bit frustrated about how stubborn the Unilevers <laughs> of this world are. <laughs> and then when I, I did 10 years of that in Spain, when I came back in the Netherlands, I was looking for something more tangible. That's when I ran into the, the concepts and, and, and the ideas of Doug as well. And I got very inspired by seaweed. Fell in love with it and the rest is history. Great. Follow your passion. You heard that before, right? Uh, Doug, what about the fish? Yes, I Do they eat seaweed? I, I would like to, to touch on fish food because it's a very, very important part of, of the food chain and we are here talking about the food chain. Yesterday you, you heard uh, fish food is made up primarily of fish meal. Now that's, that's ridiculous. Uh, fish farming is one of the, the biggest expanding food sources of, of the world. And we are using smaller and smaller fish to, to kill them, catch them, kill them, mince them up and feed them to the f fish in, in the fish farms. I mean that, that doesn't make sense at all. Why do we do that? Because the proteins we add to the fish food are all land-based proteins, and Ivanka will know a lot be better than I do because I'm, I'm out, out of my depth here, but not all proteins are, are the same. Proteins are, are made from, from amino acids, and they are not all the same. There is no... Well, fish require a certain combination of proteins, of uh, the, the amino acids, and there are no land-based products, no matter how uh, protein efficient or protein rich they are, including soya bean, which is the uh, uh, main ad additive to, to fish food, there is no land-based product that has the amino acids that, that fish require for their health and growth. So what does the in industry do? They add fish meal, because that gives them then the, the proteins that, that the fish require. Every single protein that is required by fish is in seaweed. Every single protein. It's, it's there. So it's getting better and better all the time. It, it of course, makes sense. <laughs> seaweed grows in the sea. Fish live in, in the sea. It makes sense. The fish don't come out on, onto the land and eat, eat our soya beans, but we force them to eat the soya beans because that's what, what we feed them, and it isn't the right thing. We need to have a change of thinking, guys. We you have a ready audience here. Mm. Questions, ladies and gentlemen, for our extraordinary panel. Uh, yeah, here, in there. Ah. Uh, 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 there. <laughs> Just uh, uh, two things. What, when I, I wish to rem remember you that today uh, fishes are eating mainly plastics. This is key to, to remember, so we have to uh, stop the, the plastics uh, 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 going in the, in the water. Very, very key. And uh, the second thing is uh, um, Günther is pushing me regarding the Rapanui uh, project to put seaweed uh, there. And uh, uh, for that, I need a press study. And uh, are you agree to do a press study for the Rapa Nui as free? Uh, it means uh, no, no, uh, we have no, uh, not to pay for that. I can add this uh, in the in the, the global uh, files. Sure. Thank you. You said that uh, seaweed could also be used in textile. Could it, uh, could it replace cotton as well then? Yes. Or? Where's the question coming from? Oh. Uh, seaweed no, can replace I know, textile. Yeah, sorry, I was looking for mm. it. No, I, the, the, uh, one of the, there is a, in Holland there's a company, a beer refinery that's using seaweed and transforms in different things. And one of the things right now is called geotextile. So that's, if you just imagine uh, when you put uh, plants in, 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 in the earth, there, uh, to cover their roots you have, now you use polymers, you look plastic bags, they make that now out of seaweed. So that means that if you, once it's growing out, it just dissolves. 
Uh, and yes, the next step is to transform it into cotton. So, uh, Patagonia is looking into how to transform seaweed to take the fibers out and use them. Uh, they're not there yet, but it is possible. There are two producers of uh, seaweed textiles in China. They're based in Qingdao. Um, they are meeting now one million ton capacity. That's the production wrap-up they're having. And they're already both in Germany and in Austria. The textile company is called Lensing. And they're already yeah. producing today a 25% mix with seaweed and wool. Yeah. So it's getting on the market now. If I can just add to that, seaweed lives in a very, very harsh environment. And it's a very smart al algae. It, it is made up of cells that are pr protected by cellulose. And that cellulose is extremely strong. It has to be because of the, the environment, the seaweed is living in. So the cellulose that you harvest from seaweed is of a much higher quality than what, what you are harvest off, off the land. A last question, Mampella. A microphone. Thank you. I can't resist uh, the Padenost connection. Because I really, if you go back to the picture that I showed all of you yesterday of the nectopus, and you, uh, you were talking about how do we get deal flow. I mean, Padenoste is the home of the most humiliated indigenous people in South Africa, the, the, koi. the koi. And I can see a wonderful combination of them being part of the rollout of your seaweed production system, the mushrooms. And of course, the West Coast is also an area further inland where there is um, uh, farming, which is very difficult because of the, the water situation. But I think we've got an interesting possibility of an ecosystem being developed there, which can transform the lives of those indigenous uh, first people of South Africa. So I'm very excited. And uh, Doug and I spoke yesterday, and I'm even more enthusiastic than I was yesterday. Thank you. I'm looking for Christopher to give me indications. Um, while Christopher's, any, any quick question from anyone? Thank you. I wanted to ask uh, about seaweeds and legislation because I, as far as I know, if it's food, you can't make energy out of it, at least in land crops. So for <coughs> biofuels, how do you deal with that? No, no, the, the great thing of, of, uh, of, of seaweed is, as, as Dirk also explained, is that you can almost cascade different applications. You can cascade it down so you can take out ingredients. If, for instance, you can take the proteins, extract the proteins, and then you still have a remnant, which you then can use as a biomass for energy. Um, the legislation is, uh, to be honest, I didn't run into that yet. So it might be that in some areas of some countries you have that. Uh, one funny thing is, if you talk about bureaucracy, I was talking to the Dutch government about seaweed as a future crop. And they said, we have one tiny problem. Officially, seaweed in Brussels has not been defined as a biomass, so officially it doesn't exist. Just a minor thing. I, I can an answer that, that a little more fully. Dependent on your sequence of extraction of the value of seaweed, that determines the, the, the food uh, credibility of it. For example, in Indonesia, we have a project that, that we are starting to, to provide 100,000 tons of seaweed per year to the largest agar extractor in, in the world. Now, agar is, is a food product. So uh, before we do anything with that seaweed, they extract the agar. Now, we have worked with them to identify their extraction process, which needed a little bit of um, uh, modification with our help, which means after they've extracted the agar, we have a product that's left over, and I don't use waste because it isn't waste. We have a product that's left over 
that is as energy efficient as if they had not extracted the agar in, in the first place. So there is no effect in, in the cycle of food value, and yet we have the, the energy. Thank you so Thank much, you much, ladies to the, and gentlemen. To our speakers. Thank you. And uh, we found out all about seaweed and about mushrooms, so we need to be able to buy your mushrooms in Switzerland. Eh? So next year you will be oh, serving thank mushrooms. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, please, that is the business forum. So thank you very much for <laughs> mentioning it. We desperately negotiate with Migros because this final product, Migros want to involve in that uh, Selection uh, uh, title, yes, program. And they, last Tuesday has been at our place. Yes. And we expect that anywhere around October, November, this our product will be in Switzerland. Thank if you need that much. agreement, Thank you. I think that all our products. We're Maybe you can help us. Thank <laughs> you. We're running out of time, so I'm sorry. We have if some questions for the audience, please. Yes. Uh, yes. After this session, yeah, person to person. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank and you now very we, much. we want to introduce the next speaker, so we please ask the panelists to to get the floor <laughs> free. And thank you, Gunther, for the moderation. Um. Benoit, you have besoin de, de ceci, non? Je donne ça ou tu le fais assis? <laughs> <laughs>